Um, so yeah, before we begin, um, we just want to introduce ourselves. My name is Noah. I'm Sabrina. And I'm Dimitri. And today we designed this application called Foodie, um, which is a budget meal planning application that creates meal plans and grocery lists based on a weekly budget that you input Hello, into the into the uh, application. Um, so um, what, where did this motivation come from? To, um, to take a broad perspective on this, um, this is the easiest way to kind of create a weekly meal plan and grocery list based on a budget. Um, how it works is you basically put in a set amount of money that you um, that you want to spend on groceries, and you will get a you will get a list of meal plans and kind of recipes um, based on availabilities in uh, supermarkets around you. Um, and you can also input dietary restrictions, nutritional needs, and other um, accommodations that you might want to meet with these different recipes. And the Foodie app will um, output shopping lists and um, with your accommodations map. Um, and so our challenge for this was that we wanted to improve the experiences of undeserved community, underserved communities. Um, and so to kind of first address this challenge, we kind of class made different classifications of underserved communities. Um, so the story behind this is that uh, many families from underserved communities might not have the same resources that um, people in more privileged communities have. And so this limited budget is important to allocate effectively. Um, and so um, with this app, we're hoping to save time, money, and um, be more help families be more efficient, um, along with individuals be more efficient in their grocery shopping trips. Um, so to start off, we kind of address different factors that we find in underserved communities, um, which include access to less resources, lower socioeconomic status, reduced quality of healthcare, um, and varied standard of living. And the two factors that we focused most on in this application was the access to less resources and a very standard of living while taking into account their time and some aspect of reduced quality of healthcare. Um, so based off of this, we started doing some user experience research um, and we found that some of our insights were that um, low income is associated with a less healthy diet as seen by, um, as demonstrated by the American Bar Association and um, Adam Junoski in the economics of obesity. Um, they established that a higher diet quality is associated with higher incomes um, and communities that can't necessarily afford healthy food um, have higher obesity rates, glucose levels, and higher rates of uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and then the final point is time and transportation costs hinder reliable access to resources. This is most applicable, especially right now in the time of COVID-19, um, where many low income workers have no choice but to work outside of their home in order to provide for their families and um, put themselves at risk for um, to make enough to get the food that they need. Um, and so the three main pain points that we pulled from our user research was that there was not enough time um, to find and plan meals with the excessive work that's needed. Um, there was an inability um, or a difficulty in finding a balance between getting healthy food and um, maintaining a budget. And then finally, there was another um, inability to see which stores accommodate their budget and help that they need. Um, and so moving on to user personas, Sabrina will introduce the two users we have. Yeah, so for our first persona, we have a student. Um, his name is Jackson Long, and Jackson's a 20-year-old university student at Stanford. Um, he's currently taking a full course load on top of extracurriculars. Um, so he has a very busy schedule week by week. Um, as a result, he doesn't have a ton of time to meal prep or like plan what groceries he wants to buy or just think about what he wants to eat. Um, so on top of this, he has to like manage his budget to pay for expensive costs um, while going to like an expensive university. Um, so desires and motivations, he hopes to get good grades at this university and manage his extracurriculars um, and also use his resources as effectively as possible. And then our next persona is a mom of four children. Her name is Shannon Gable. Um, she's a 37 year old mom raising a family of four vegetarian children. Um, she's currently in school and working a part time job as a librarian. So with the super busy um, schedule and a small paycheck, being mom of four children, she finds it difficult to find time to meal prep and grocery shop. She has to buy groceries on, the, on a limited budget and wants to be able to maximize her money and time. Um, so basically she hopes to provide for herself and her family with filling meals throughout the week and not spend too much time figuring out when to buy groceries. 
So our solution to this problem was to create a mobile application that formulates meal plans and shopping lists based on the user's budgets, nutrition, and dietary needs and preferences. So like, for example, in the previous one, she was vegetarian. So just to like make each meal plan unique to each person. Okay, so as for our journey map, um, first we have that the user runs out of groceries at home. So they're thinking, where am I gonna get groceries? What do I wanna buy? So they're feeling flustered, pressured, a little bit stressed. So the user would open the food app, foodie app and enter their how much money they're willing to spend on food, their dietary needs and restrictions, and the number of people they're hoping to feed. Um, now they're thinking, look at all these options, which selections would be best. Now they're feeling more optimistic, excited, but a little indecisive still. Um, so the user next selects a meal plan and saves the list or gets a delivery. They're thinking these meals were catered perfectly towards me. This process was so easy. Now they're satisfied and enthusiastic. And now they get their groceries and they're so excited to cook their meals, eat well for the next week. And now they feel confident, eager to cook and relieved that they don't have as much stress on their plate. Um, so to look over our design, I essentially created a user flow, which is basically an architecture of the entire app. Um, it's kind of hard to see um, what's actually going on. It looks kind of complicated, but it follows a similar architecture as um, most applications would. Um, of course, you first start out by installing the app. You're introduced by a welcome screen. You go through the, the usual um, uh, sign up, onboarding, verification, and then you go into the main screen. Now, when you're on the main screen, you now have two modes of interaction. It's either through the main screen where you have a filter, search bar, notifications, and you have the opportunity to put a budget in. Later on, we're adding the feature where you would be able to um, filter by popular meal items, though this is not shown in our final um, um, high fidelity mockup. Now your second mode of interaction is gonna be through the menu. When you're on the menu, you're gonna be able to interact with the profile, saved, and cart menus. Once you're on the profile menu, you'll be able to access your address, vouchers, payments, my orders, and your saved recipes. Um, we believe that the saved recipes is probably one of the more vital parts of the application because now this gives the opportunity for, um, let's say, lower socioeconomic people or people in rural backgrounds to save all their different recipes or meal plans on their phone without having to depend on a delivery or curbside pickup or reliable internet on a regular basis. So we're providing convenience in this way. Now, if you're going to the main screen, um, we have a recipe view. And by the time you're on the recipe view, you're looking over the recipe. You see all the different ingredients. When you're seeing all the different ingredients, you're seeing all the prices for um, you know, a specific recipe. All the different recipes are optimized so that you would have um, maximal nutrition for the lowest price possible. Um, by that point, you're gonna move on to the cart, check out, payment, and then tracking. And by that point, you've now completed the order. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see exactly that process. To break down the colors, I decided to use a red um, color because um, it's widely known in color psychology that red is associated with um, food, hunger, um, and, and uh, other such adjectives. If you look at on uh, the first mockup, you'll see that there's a visual hierarchy, um, primarily focusing on the weekly budget. So. When a user is first interacting with the application, they're going to first define how many people that they're serving. It could be one person, let's say a college student who just wants to feed themselves through the week, or it could be a family who wants to serve their entire family of four to five people, maybe six, however much you want to define. By that point, you're going to move on to the weekly budget. You're going to type in whatever number um, seems appropriate for your weekly budget. There's also um, some other um, bars that you can just simply click on and go into intervals of 50. Um, you can go under $100, under $150, under $200, etc. Under that, you'll see a search bar where you can look up specific recipes that you might be familiar with. 
And then you can also filter based on um, dietary preferences or restrictions. Under that, you'll be able to scroll under and see all the different recipes that are available to you. I wanted to make it as easy as possible for you to simply add a recipe and simply click on it or just view more. It also shows that the title of the recipe, how much it's cost, I wanted to put the price of the recipe as probably the most important part because that's the entire point of the app. And then also, if you look under the price of the uh, recipe, you'll see how many groceries it adds to your shopping cart. Um, at the bottom, you'll see on the menu, of course, as we mentioned before, you have home profile saved in your shopping cart. Your shopping cart is um, highlighted so that you know how many items are currently in your shopping cart. Um, as you go through the process, let's say you click on the shopping cart, you see what's in your shopping cart. Um, you'll see how much everything costs. You click on checkout, you check the cart. Um, by that point, you add any um, uh, of your Visa cards, debit cards, credit cards, et cetera. You go on to purchase. And by that point, you'd have the opportunity to either choose curbside pickup, or you can choose to um, go through Instacart or um, any, uh, any other such um, meal delivery um, application. For the next slide, um, this is just simply a mock-up, uh, just a you know visually pleasing um, demonstration of what the application looks like. Um, I hope you enjoyed our presentation, and I hope it was at least somewhat informative. Yeah, nice job, guys. That was super awesome. Um, we'll open it up to questions, um, and if Ben and Alex have any questions or critiques, um, we can talk about those now. No questions for my side. I, I was able to see some of this yesterday, or not see, but learn about the idea. So it's pretty clear to me, but I think you guys did a, a great job of like bringing it to life in a fairly short amount of time. So, uh, you know, in terms of like the level of fidelity looks great. Um, I, I like how you guys were able to transition the story and really tell a succinct story about, um, you know, the, the reason why you guys came up with the idea and, and kind of flow through how it would be used. So I think you guys did a great job. And um, I don't know if Alex had any questions or thoughts. I, don't, I think you probably didn't see this idea yet, right, Alex? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, yeah, I, I echo Ben's uh, comments. And I think there's a really clear line between what the product is and who it's for and why it exists. Um, it's, it's clear how it saves people time and, and solves a lot of the needs. Um, and I thought the um, UI was actually pretty innovative. I haven't seen anything else like that, but that also doesn't mean you do seem to do things that were just gratuitous. Um, there seemed to be a really clear reason to do them, um, uh, which I really liked. I think one thing I, that uh, as I think about it is just like the tie into like an Instacart or like a delivery service because usually there's a like a upcharge for that right or there's a delivery fee or charge so just wondering if if they're um, budget conscious they may maybe that kind of a partnership or uh, integration may not work initially they may have to go to the store still themselves or you know have to go and at least they have a list now and they may have to actually pick up some items or, or it can be packed at the store but they may be responsible for picking up but um you know everything else seems pretty viable yeah i agree um i think like your high five was uh it looked really great um and i think i agree with alex i think there's a really clear line between your research and um, your final product um, yeah, I agree with Ben. I think the only critique would be, um, I think, considering where you want to put or where in your flow you want to put those kinds of integrations. Um, because up until like the last slide where you said, um, we'll be exporting like this list to like Instacart or um, wherever. Um, up until that point, I was like, did he select a store before? Like, are all of these ingredients going to be at like this specific store? Is he going to have to pull from multiple stores? Um, so I think just considering um, 
where in the flow you put that um, step um, would be important. But yeah, great job overall. Super great. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, Hannah, you said your team wanted to go next? Yeah, we'd love to go next. Okay, cool. Uh, I think Bietta is going to share her screen. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll get started. Um, hi, thank you for having us. We're the team Universal Uniters. The name was inspired by our aligned goals in making a difference through design. Um, and we're, we're really excited to share our process as well as our solution for groups, how might we challenge. Um, and so today we're gonna be going through our problem, our user research, our solution and conclusion and future implications. I'll hand it off to Kathy. Yes, um, thank you, Hannah. So given the prompt of improving the underserved community experience, we set out to brainstorm what sectors are the underserved communities facing difficulties. Um, and healthcare came to our mind. We realized that there's a lot of missed opportunities, miscommunication and frustration and negative stigma towards the healthcare system within the underserved community. Um, and they all seem to intersect at one major challenge, uh, which is the language barrier. And with that said, we were able to narrow down our scope to how might we bridge the gap between interpreters and people who, um, and people who need them. And I'll pass it on to Viata to discuss our user research. Yeah, so our main groups that we were designing for were people who were non-native language speakers um, who needed interpreters for everyday life or medical interpreters, also the elderly for those same reasons and people with hearing disabilities to connect um, users with ASL interpreters. Furthermore, we kept the interpreters on the other side of the app, the, the program in mind um, to maximize their experience as well. So some really interesting statistics that we found was that according to a UCSF research study, doctors tend to underuse available interpreters even when they are available on site. Another really imp interesting point was that in 2019, approximately 46% of the 44.6 million immigrants in the United States ages five and older were considered limited English proficient. Furthermore, in 2019, immigrants made up 13.7% of the US population, the highest it has been since the creation of the census. There are faults in the interpret, there are faults in the interpreter process. Um, the CEO of the National Association of the Deaf says that hospitals, medical centers, and doctor's offices are the worst in failing to provide effective communications to, the, to deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And he proceeded to say that the, these, this was attributed to interpreters um, take hours to arrive and then aren't present during the duration of the visit. And then I'll give it off to Kathy to, oh, sorry. Um, so we did some user research and we spoke to three different parties. Um, one was named Emma, she is 20 years old and she's a volunteer as a Spanish interpreter at a physical therapy free clinic. Um, another person we spoke with was Anna who is 49 and a first generation Chinese immigrant. And lastly, we spoke to Marina who's age 76 also a first generation Russian immigrant. Um, Emma believed that her, her biggest struggles were in hearing the person, learning body language, and um, believed that the strengths and weaknesses of the interpreter, knowing that and being able to see a, to revisit with the same subjects would improve the interpreting process um, because they would be able to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses and learn each other's body language, um, making communication better. Anna said that her experience with interpreters are 
frustrating and that a lot of the times she doesn't think that the translator understands what they mean and so she doesn't feel like she would trust them. Lastly, Marina, who by coincidence was is an immigrant and also had experience interpreting, so she was on both sides, um, reflected that she was able to form a better connection with repeating patients than with people that she interpreted once and never helped again. Um, she believed this came from her uh, development of trust with the interpreter and the patient, and that this could led to um, an increased sense of empathy with the patient's pain and struggles, um, which is an experience that can get lost in translation um, due to the language barrier. And so an emotional connection helps prevent this. And then we'll move on to the yeah, storyboard. So, yes, I'll take over from here. Um, so moving on to our first scenario, um, we are starting off with our interpreter persona. Um, we'll introduce Catherine, who is a 19 year old public health student and a part-time ASL medical interpreter. And um, before finding a platform, she was the only volunteer ASL contracted inter interpreter at her local clinic. And she is always overbooked, always feeling stressed, even though she loves what she do and she finds a lot of meaning um, in her work. She Sometimes she even thinks that she is not compensated enough for the amount of work that she does. So Catherine needs a platform where she can showcase her qualifications and find flexibility and control over her time. Um, she was introduced to Overcome and is intrigued to try it out. She signs up and was able to receive a booking in three days. And because she is certified, she was able to have access to some of the patient's medical information and better understand the patient's background. Thus, she feels more empathetic and sensitive when listening and speaking to the patient. Um, ultimately, she enjoys her experience on the platform. She appreciates the, the flexibility and the personal connection that she was able to establish with the patient. And she became she becomes the uh, the patient's long term interpreter and eventually helps multiple patients with ASL needs during her free time. Our next persona is kind of for our typical user, and we're introducing John, who is a 67 year old veteran with hearing disability and needs um, ASL service. So he, while John is generally an outgoing person who loves to cook, hike, and read. He has a lot of difficulty carrying out daily activities and running errands that requires communication. For example, grocery shopping, um, going to the doctor and as well as dropping off a package at the UPS, whatnot. Um, um, recently, he started experiencing back pain after a recent hike. Um, he was able to make an appointment for a doctor's appointment for the next day with the help of, a, of an emergency ASL service provider but was notified that in order to book the same interpreter who already knew his basic situation and medical information again, he needs to wait in line for at least another two weeks. Um, and so obviously he, John ended up without an interpreter booked and next morning he was stressed about having to communicate himself with his doctor until he came across the Overcome platform on a morning article. John is generally skeptical about technology but he decides to try the service. And but the problem is, how can we instill more trust between John and the platform? And this is where the Overcome platform provides onboarding walkthrough videos with ASL translations to help John feel more at ease from the beginning of the signup process. Um, John was also able to filter through different interpreter profiles for medical certifications, experiences, uh, reviews, as well as their availabilities. And after his booking, John goes to his appointment and the Overcome platform was actually presented to John um, from the medical facility. It was presented by the nurse. Um, he was offered with an iPad that already, um, that where he could just log on to Overcome and speak with his interpreter. So at the end, he really enjoys his interpreter service and decides to book the in interpreter again for his um, returning doctoral visits and back and forth, he uh, builds a long-term relationship with the interpreter and they instill trust. And we have another persona, but in the for the sake of time, we will omit this and just move on to presenting our solution. Okay, so onto the solution. 
we know we just threw so much information at you. Um, and the reason for that being is the kind of platform we're building just requires that much background um, research. And you're probably wondering what this all resulted in. So we're introducing Overcom. Overcom, the name really is supposed to mean overcome through communication. Um, so we're a nonprofit owned app that has dual access via computer or mobile phone. The reason for this being um, some communities don't have, you know, like an iPhone. So we just want to make it as accessible as possible. Um, so similar to Spotify, it's on your computer, it's on your phone. Um, it connects and matches interpreters to those in need of reliable translation services like John. And some of the main features, I won't list them all out here, but um, personalized profiles, they're very um, personable. There's direct messaging and FaceTime. You can you know, have a calendar and directly schedule things. Um, and there's also a lot of health and safety precautions. Now that you know what we do, how do we mitigate costs and provide service to all? So this was an issue that we realized along the way we had to consider. There's a lot of background things um, and we noticed there were untapped potential in receiving on the receiving end. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> so there's a huge audience of those in needs, but how do we provide incentivization or in, how do we incentivize the interpreters? Um, medical and, and special need accommodation interpreters might get a higher base pay for interpreters online if there's a request and if they can pick it up in under five minutes, we could also offer a, a benefit or pay rate that's higher. Um, so we know a lot of interpreters, you know, like they have full time jobs um, on the side too, and maybe they won't make as much using this app, but they'd probably be inclined to use both because of how convenient and beneficial the app is um, and how um, how it really builds trust, there's background checks, you're matched to a client who's there to stay. Um, and we're really just trying to build trust. So the next thing we're gonna show you is a video explanation leading into our solution. Um, and let me know if you can't hear the audio. This is John, a 67 year old veteran with a hearing disability and need sign language service. John's disability and language barrier lead to many communication inconveniences in his daily life. For example, grocery shopping, doctor's visits, and mailing packages at postal services. For doctor's appointments, John often waits for weeks before a healthcare sign language interpreter becomes available. This is when he discovered Overcome. Overcome is a communication platform helping the underserved community to overcome language barriers. Within minutes of signing up, John can be connected to a certified medical interpreter of his preferred language. John and his long-term interpreter, Catherine, have communicated together for many sessions. The connection and trust between him and Catherine help John communicate with his healthcare provider more effectively. John no longer worries about booking a medical sign language interpreter weeks ahead or being limited by language barriers during normal activities like grocery shopping and mailing a package. No matter what language barrier you face, you can rely on our platform. Overcome, bridging languages, connecting people. Yeah, so that's just a snippet of kind of our mindset as we move into the prototype. Um, let's see. So now we're going to show you our mid fidelity prototype. Um, this is John. <laughs> When we um, approached this, we studied layouts and features of platforms that either matched people or use algorithms for recommendations, such as Netflix, Yelp. We did a lot of looking at dating apps. Um, <laughs> and so we brainstormed and sketched some ideas before bringing it to life. Um, we really wanted our design to make connecting and setting up schedules instant, reliable, and detailed. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see a bit more of what it looks like when um, a person has their profile set up and is searching for um, interpreters for translation. There's filters, so it's very personalized. Um, there's transparency. You can see ratings and reviews for quality control. Um, and basically, the reason we have all these algorithms for matching someone with you is because you want someone that will last. We're emphasizing consistency and trust, um, making connections and communication stronger, incentivizing usage on both ends. And so you can see going into like direct messaging, um, there's a lot of information, so it's uh, verified. 
And lastly, we'll move into our conclusion, um, user feedback. So due to time constraints, our team didn't get to test out everything with all our interview interviewees, but we did explain the purposes of Overcom, how the platform works along with our video and mockups and received um, feedback such as the following. I think a platform like this would really benefit me during errands where I have to communicate with English, but what if I'm outside and don't have internet access? This uh, quote came from Kathy's mom, um, and it just gives us an example of things that we need to consider moving forward and how to improve our platform. Um, other things, all three of us have different reflections that we wanted to contribute. Um, personally, something I'd want to do is more lo-fi sketches that users could walk us through and voice their thoughts as they walk through it, an interactive click-through wireframe for user testing, um, definitely talking to people who are users, because personally, I don't know someone who's ASL, for example. So how do I know what they want on their profile and what they prioritize in interpreters? Um, and then just demonstrating more features in the Figma wireframe of prototyping, such as the calendar. Um, future visions, how can we expand this to say legal interpreters or AI interpreters? And in summary, I'm gonna hand it off to Pieta. Um, so reflecting back on our how we might how might we statement, we do think that we can bridge the gap between interpreters and people who need them. With our program's emphasis on developing trust between interpreter and user, customizability for scheduling and other preferences, and the benefits for an inter the interpreter in both the monetary and usability sense, we really see Overcom's ability to change the way people communicate in the future. Thank you. Nice job, guys. Um, ben and Alex, do you all have any critique? Sure, I can go. Um, um, and I, I just want to say I'm about to offer much more critique. I'm sorry to the first group. Um, I wasn't prepared to, uh, I was going to wait till the end, so I took notes. But, so I'm gonna, this is going to be much more in depth, um, and I'll continue to do that. But um, so, um, I thought the um, the graphic at the beginning that narrowed the challenge was really good. You started from healthcare and you narrowed it down to interpreters, which is a really hard thing to do, but also necessary to to actually have an impact. I think um, so. I thought that was really good, and, and just even the visualization really helped me. Um, it was very cool you were able to talk to people. Um, I, I'm you know to do that in such a short period of time, um, and and it seemed like you had a good diversity of users that were credible for this particular product too. Um, these are people who clearly had something to say about it. Um, I was a little bit confused by your use of the journey map. It seemed to be used for users rather than for the personas. And I think in this case, if you're using it for the users, you're making some assumptions about the product already. When So you can't then go back to the persona and say, this is what the persona's life is like, so maybe we should tweak the, 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 the product itself to match what the user's needs are. You, you really jump very quickly into the product itself. So you, you have to make assumptions there. You may not, they may not be valid. Um, I like to use a photo of Gary Oldman from one of your personas. Um, uh, he's an actor, a really good one. Uh, I think um, for platforms like this, um, you have to you have to start it by subsidizing one side of them. So you either have to make it really pay the providers much more than market rates, or um, charge the people using it much lower than market rates. So just practically speaking, if you do go and take this take this into the world, you'll have to raise some money um, in order to do that because um, you'll have to make it more enticing than whatever else is out there. Even though this is probably infinitely better. Um, and then finally. Your next steps. Um, it's a great way to end a presentation like this because you didn't have like any time to really work on it, and so it can be a really good discussion topic for the end of it, where people can really hone in on talking about those next steps um, and, and how to help you. So, I that, hope that was helpful. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, definitely, uh, we're really passionate about this project, and we would love to go back and the things you said to making revisions so thank you yeah i think it was great that you guys actually spoke to people and even did some user testing in, in such a short period of time um so i think you know you guys did spend uh, quite a bit of time in the research and, and user uh research uh 
to get an understanding of what you wanted to do, which is helpful. Um, obviously, um, you know, a day to work on this isn't a lot of time. So doing that was great. I think um, kind of what Alex was saying is like thinking through the, the business model a bit more is probably important because, you know, getting, I think, I know you guys mentioned like getting like the health insurance or somebody to pay, probably not very realistic initially. Um, that takes time. Um, so thinking through like how you would monetize and even if the company is a nonprofit, like how do you make it um, worthy of like the, the providers to come in and because they're going to want to make some money and then not creating a big barrier to the users who may not have the funds to support paying these people, right? So if, if it's, you know, raising money or, or doing, thinking of some other way aside from just relying on kind of healthcare benefits, which we all know aren't the greatest to begin with. So things like this probably wouldn't um, be approved, right? So I think just the idea is great. It's just thinking through how you make the business model work. But I think overall, it's a, a great uh, concept. And then also just thinking about like, even you guys, have, you honed it out, down pretty quickly, but I guess, you know, maybe targeting, you guys didn't talk too much about um, kind of the most common uh, languages or like maybe, you know, honing down initially on some of the more common languages that, uh, you know, based on population size or stuff like that might be something that, to start at as well. Yeah, um, actually the third journey map that we kind of skipped over for the sake of time, that was going to be our general use case. Um, we would have made multiple prototypes for those different ones, but I don't know, we just decided why don't we go with a unique case. Yeah. yeah, by far Spanish is the most commonly spoken language in the U.S. So we would probably start with that. Mm -hmm. And also, are are we allowed to are we allowed to respond to critiques, or should we just move on? I, I think that's up to Connor. Um, yeah, if you make them really quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then in in terms of monetization, we were thinking of taking into account the value chain, um, and like doing research on how much money is lost in different cases of miscommunication than reaching out to those populations and just starting off that way is was our reasoning. Yeah, nice job guys. Um, so we're gonna move to our next group. Um, are there any volunteers? Um, Dia, Annie, Catherine, Drew, Daniel, are you all ready? Um, yeah, sure, we can go. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, sounds good. Just a heads up for the rest of the teams. Um, try to keep it to 10 minutes, um, just so you all have enough time for a critique, um, and so we don't go over. Thanks. Um, I'll just share my screen really quickly. Um, just double checking that uh, everyone can see it. All right, cool. Um, so, Dia, whenever you're ready, you take it away. Thanks, Annie. So, hey everyone, we are Budget Buddy Finance Made Friendly. My name is Dia. Uh, I'm Annie. I'm Drew. I'm Daniel. And I'm Catherine. So here's our agenda for today. We'll be covering our objectives, methodology, synthesis, and conclusion. So let's dive right into it. So first of all, our objective. When our group was first brainstorming ideas, the topic of personal finance quickly came up. It's something that's so crucial yet often overlooked. We are talking about how none of us knows how to do our taxes, how stocks work, or even how to budget effectively. So after conducting some secondary research, we found out that only six of, out of the 50 United States require students to take personal finance in high school. Unsurprisingly, this leaves over half of American adults feeling financially anxious with a current student loan debt of over 1.75 trillion. When we are ideating and developing solutions, we are specifically targeting college students because of the diversity of underserved communities represent, particularly low-income communities. But we also soon realized that 
we hope to cater to anyone who considers themselves financially illiterate. Um, so moving forward with our methodology, um, we conducted a little bit of research on the existing resources and identified some drawbacks um, of current apps that are out there. So this included uh, YNAB, Mint, and also traditional banking apps that all serve budgeting purposes. So we found that um, while some of them had uh, both pros and cons, many of them were not student tailored. And we plan to address all of these with our app Budget Buddy. Okay, so we can briefly go over like the information architecture. Sorry if it's a little hard to see, but um, basically you, when you launch your app, you get to sign up. So you, if you have an account, um, you can sign in. If not, um, sign up for an account. Um, then you go to your home, um, which will set up, show you like a dashboard, a bunch of like um, visualizations of some certain data. So it will kind of show you like certain bar graphs for different categories. So for example, um, categories of needs, so for example, like food, transportation, um, housing, healthcare, and stuff like that. Um, so it'll show you how much you spent for that category, but also like, you know, how much um, of that budget you have left. So it'll just let you know if you're in danger of exceeding and stuff. Um, and then give it two other tabs, you have timeline and then you have opportunities. So timeline will just kind of like give you um, right away, like what that, what are some upcoming deadlines that you have to pay for, so such as like credit cards or like bills, taxes, et cetera. Um, and then for goals, you can set up, set like uh, short-term goals. So something like very temporary, like groceries or long-term goals, something like stocks, savings, which kind of go for a like, perennial amount of time. And then for opportunities, since this is um, tailored for students, we want to give them an easy way to access like, like a scholarship database so they can find something that will fund their um, tuition and stuff. Um, so um, that's where this tab comes in handy. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll move on to the um, wireframe prototypes to kind of give you a more visual sense of how this works. So the main uh, UI challenge we were trying to solve was um, in the other apps that we saw, there wasn't a very clear one-stop hub that uh, allowed for students to budget effectively. So with our uh, finance dashboard, you can see that we, the first thing in the visual hierarchy that draws your eye in is that 95% of uh, food budget spent. So that's your indicator of where you are along in your either weekly, monthly, or however you want to quantify your budget. So that was our main goal was to just uh, highlight the, the progress made and keep people aware in at a glance uh, where they are. So right below that, you can see some tips for saving more. That's uh, some recommendations if you are, you know, going towards the end of your budget, how to stretch that. Um, and it is color cued. So as it uh, progresses to be almost filled up, it will be red. If it's uh, you have a lot of money to spend, it'll be green. And if it's in the middle, it'll be yellow, as you can see um, on our timeline feature with our short term and long term goals, there's different color coding. Um, additionally, we wanted to have a, a typeface that was um, it's Roboto sound. So it's it's kind of a mechanical skeleton, but also has friendly curves, um, which are both um, inviting yet uh, serious and neutral. Um, with our Find Your Scholarship opportunities, are, we haven't really built this out. Um, and visually, this is a, a mid-fire, low-fi mock-up, but uh, the goal is to sort um, by the, uh, the, the correct um, attributes of uh, what the ideal scholarship for your in, uh, individual user would be. And uh, with that, transition to the next slide. Um, so yeah, now we'll be talking about the synthesis, uh, which includes some of our personas as well as a journey map. So we have three user personas. I'll be talking about the first. So first off, we have Abby, who's a freshman at UC Berkeley from Texas. And overall, she's just feeling really overwhelmed with finances because it's something she's never had to deal with before. Um, so although she gets decent financial aid and resources from the school, she doesn't have a one-stop shop for all her needs. And especially because she's a first-gen low-income student, she can't just talk to her parents um, or get easy access to those resources. So with our app, hopefully she can track her budget, taxes, and financial goals with our various features, which I'll be getting to in our journey map later. Um, next up, we have Simon, who is a UCLA 
class of 2020 alum. Um, he's re recently moved to Berkeley as a recent grad for a new job. Um, but one of his big biggest pain points is struggling to balance rent, student debt, and a social life. So this planning um, and being able to extrapolate into the future with sustainable financial plans is really important to him. Um, so hopefully through our dashboards, deadlines, and short and long-term goal trackers, um, we can help Simon with these pain points. Our third persona is Shelly. She's a student as well as a single mom of two kids. And she has some budgeting skills, but she'd like to be able to have her uh, financial goals and any deadlines organized in one place. So like the other two personas, she'd like to have this, the um, overall dashboard where she can see all of her finances, um, as well as um, certain um, a way to kind of automate her spending habits for her kids, like food, clothing, um, and as well as a way to track her savings that are building up small, um, like her small savings that are building up gradually. Now let's do a deep dive with how Abby would actually interact with her solution in, our day, in her day-to-day -day life. So at 9 a.m. in the morning, she wakes up, gets ready, and leaves for her first class. She doesn't have much time, but the app decides to ping her with an inspirational quote of the day. She's feeling pretty motivated and optimistic so far. After a couple hours of classes, she takes her lunch break and just catches up on her favorite TV show. No work, no school, no finances, nothing. Just a little breather before her day gets heavier. After a long day of classes, she decides to head to the library. The app reminds her that she has three days left to apply for financial aid, which she would have forgotten about without the reminder. She feels simultaneously panicked, but also relieved. After she finishes work for the day, she decides to get, her, get dinner with her friends after a long Thursday evening. The app alerts her that she spent 95% of her budget on food. She, she thinks like, oh no, I should have gotten something cheaper instead. But since the week's almost over, she's not feeling too bad. Um, once she gets home, she works on homework for a few hours and checks the app. It recommends, based on her activities earlier in the day, it recommends her recipes for her to try out to save on food. Um, so because she doesn't have much time tomorrow, she decides to go with an instant oats recipe she found. And she's feeling pretty hopeful. And finally, like most of us do, she checks her phone before going to, to bed. The app shows her a, a visualization of her short-term girl goals, progress, and a, a little motivating message. She's, although she's feeling tired from the day, she's also feeling satisfied and content. Uh, moving along, we'll be concluding with our final thoughts and next steps. So ultimately what we want to accomplish with this app is to create um, an approach that anyone who is lacking in financial knowledge um, or resources uh, that may be new to finance can use our app and be able to develop healthy spending habits, um, build upon um, their credit, and as well as pay off any loans or debts that they may have um, through our easy and kind of all in one, one stop approach. And as for our next steps, um, we want to be able to use some data analysis to kind of look at a user's spending habits and then be able to develop ways, goals to kind of improve upon them, as well as creating a question form separate from our frequently asked questions so that professionals can answer questions from users that are, that are a bit more specific. And these are the references that we used. Thank you, everyone. Nice job, guys. Um, yeah, Ben and Alex, do you all have any critique? Uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting that you guys showed the personas after the idea. Um, I think showing the personas first 
tends to give you a little bit more context before you jump into the idea. Uh, and then maybe doing the user journey after still uh, would have been nice, just uh, thinking about the, the flow of the presentation. But I think you still got the point across, which was great. Um, it was good that you guys referenced the existing offerings in the space and kind of did a little bit of a benchmark there because initially when you guys said the idea I was kind of like well there's already things like that but then kind of highlighting what was different uh, or what you're planning on doing uh, was good and then I guess just thinking about again like the business model there I know you guys were talking about free access um, to to all was kind of one of the the points did you guys think about like a way to monetize on this the app or what, what was kind of the the thinking there um, we didn't really think too in depth uh, about it, but uh, one of the main things, especially with apps such as Mint and YNAB, is that uh, they do have a free version, but if you really want to take full access, there is um, a subscription-based fee. Um, in terms of monetizing this app, because we do want to keep it free access for students, uh, we were hoping uh, either for some uh, partnerships with universities or uh, similar institutions um, in terms of subsidizing this app, um, even if free access isn't really uh, something that is possible, at least making it low cost and accessible to students is our main priority. Great. Uh, Alex, I don't know if you had anything. Um, it's really, it was nice to see the, I met with you guys, so it was nice to see the conclusion to it. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what Ben said, um, uh, actually all of what Ben said. Um, uh, the for the competitive matrix, it was it went a little bit quickly, but and I th I don't know if you call it out, but I think you did, which is that the unique part of this is really integrating with student debt and and making sure that budgeting is aligned with what people can spend um, with their student debt. Uh, uh, and if it's not, it wasn't clear. At least that's what the takeaway I got um, was that that's how this is really differentiated. Um, um, uh, also, it, I agree it was interesting that you put personas last. Um, I think if you do put them first, they can be used as justifications for later decisions um, where you talk about decisions in the app. And similarly, in the personas, um, some of the wants and needs were seem like you had features in mind already for the, for the wants and needs, um, which is tricky because um, when you go back to the persona and you try to figure out whether or not it actually meets a want or need, you're kind of locked into that feature choice. So keeping them broader rather than targeted, like sometimes you use the word they need scheduling and sometimes it was a little bit more like they need um, this type of scheduling and this, at least that's the sense I got just quickly reading them. So keeping them broader um, as pain points, I think will help you later on. Um, and then, for the user journey, I, I like to have feelings um, that that brought it home, and um, I'm just just reading the feelings. I empathized with the with the user at that time, so I like that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it was nice to see how this ended up. So good job, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, great job, guys. Um, just a comment from me. Um, I think if you all want to continue pursuing this um, product and sort of like explore that further. Um, I would recommend looking at a company called SoFi, S-O-F-I. Um, B has actually done a project with them. Um, you can look at it on our Behance. I think theirs is a little more macro than what you all were shooting for. Um, but if you all are interested, um, I think that would be a good resource. I can um, link it to you if you want. Um, yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, does any other team want to volunteer to go next? I can go. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Isabel. Um, thanks for having me here at Intersect. All right, after doing some initial research on issues within underserved communities, I found that low-income communities often have a hard time accessing healthy foods. 
Some of these reasons being the lack of reliable transportation, inability to actually afford the hub foods, and their home being in a food swamp or desert. A food desert is an area complete completely bare of grocery stores, causing the community to have zero access to healthy foods, while a food swamp is an area with grocery stores, however, they are surrounded by fast food restaurants, which are economically more appealing. I decided to ask, how might we increase accessibility to healthy foods in low-income communities? This issue is complex, so I decided to focus on the three points mentioned earlier. After doing some more extensive research about food insecurity, its causes, and the problems it causes, I found some key insights. Though there are some food programs, many low-income families lack the time to sign up for these programs due to multiple jobs caring for or caring for kids, as they require you to go out of your way to sign up for these programs and complete paperwork. Secondly, these families often live in food swamps and deserts, either cutting off all access to healthy foods or presenting it as a less appealing option. On the topic of food swamps, junk food is often uh, found to be cheap and accessible. Research has found that low-income communities choose junk food less for the taste, but rather its cheap nature. Furthermore, lack of mobility also affects these families, as reliable transportation to food, uh, foods is not, or sorry, stores is not often available. Finally, healthy foods in general are too expensive for individuals to buy enough of to feed their family. Um, to synthesize my research, I decided to create a journey map of one of uh, a low-income individual going to a grocery store. It is a little long, so I'll go through it quickly. The first stage is going to the grocery store. Um, this per the person may be looking for modes of transportation, whether that be public transportation or a personal car, looking at their pantry to see what's missing. User may be feeling excited and potentially annoyed at their lack of convenient transportation. The next stage is the shopping itself. The person will be looking at their items for grocery list and additional appealing items. They may be thinking, oh, this is too expensive, or I wanna buy this fruit, but I can't afford it. User may be feeling a little disappointed due to their lack of options. The next stage is paying. And of course, on this stage, they're paying. Um, some thoughts might be, oh, I might have to take this out, or I'm excited to eat some new food. Um, at this stage, the user might be feeling a little frustrated due to, their, again, their lack of options and um, the fact that they have to pay, um, take money out of their uh, bills or like money that can go through other things into going to food. And the final stage is bringing the groceries home. Depending on their transportation method, this may be a very long journey and they may be thinking, oh, this, might think, this thing might be melting on the way back or it's tough carrying all these groceries home. Though they may be feeling happy that their pantry will be full or at least a little fuller than before, they may also be feeling disappointed because they potentially could not have bought some of the foods that they wanted or it'll be a long transportation back, or sorry, a long journey back. After doing the research, I decided to create three personas. The first person is Mars. Um, Mars is a college student without a car, and the nearest grocery store is an hour walk away, so making it almost um, impossible for her to go to the grocery store um, frequently. The next person is Sam. Sam is a minimum wage worker whose grocery store does not have any fresh produce, only frozen foods and canned foods. This completely cuts off all access to healthy foods. So even if Sam wanted to, he couldn't buy any uh, healthy foods. Final person is Ryan. Ryan is a dad who cannot afford healthy foods and resorts to buying junk food instead. So I decided to look at some of the current solutions to find out why they did not work work to understand the problems, um, what problems still need to be addressed in my solution. Food pantries are an obvious answer, however, distribution only occurs approximately once a month, and produce easily goes bad during this time. Food pantries often give out um, prepackaged meals, which are often high in sodium and um, high in sugars. The second um, option is food stamps as they are a viable option. However, many low income communities, or sorry, families often cannot take advantage of this as they do not qualify. Though they may make enough money to not qualify, most of this money goes into bills. Um, I decided to look at some possible solutions or ideate some possible solutions. First a solution that I thought of was potentially a community garden. Um, some of the pros of this is that it can promote community um, and it'll be easy access to fresh produce. However, depending on the community and depending on the area, this community garden may easily die out. 
The second solution I thought of was a restaurant food leftover delivery service. Um, basically, if a restaurant has leftover food, um, they, they can have it delivered for free to any household um, of lo low income household. This can uh, reduce food waste and it can also provide fresh food as it is probably from that day. However, this food delivery service require is reliant on technology, which um, low income families may or may not have, they may not have reliant Wi-Fi. And we would also have to figure out who is driving this food and how, how are we making money off of this if the delivery service is free. And finally, I thought of block pantries, which would be basically small pantries around the block. Um, this would provide easy access to healthy foods and eliminates the need for people to transport there. Um, however, the con is that it might be dependent on sponsorships and partnerships. Introducing Pantry on Your Block. Pantry on Your Block is a fleet of small mobile food pantries stationed all over low-income neighborhoods, such that at any given point, you are 15 minutes walking distance from one. Each on your block pantry will sell food donated by grocery stores and restaurants. However, all food must meet a certain health criteria, which I will explain a little later. The process of getting food at a pantry on your block is super simple. First, you walk to your local on your block pantry, um, eliminating the need to find transportation. Secondly, you simply pick out the groceries you'd like to buy. Next, you pay a heavily reduced price for all the items bought. And finally, you simply walk home. Here are some lo-fi sketches of how it would look. I kind of drew inspiration from a bookmobile as um, those are very small and also portable. Um, I didn't want to go for a food truck because people in bookmobiles, you can actually go into them. And I wanted this to be kind of like a more of an indoor space. I wanted it to be small, 10 approximately 10 person Mac occupancy. Right here is the outer part. And this is like a cut um, this way of the a mobile food pantry. Right here are some boxes of produce, um, some shelves of pasta. And this is a long way size cut. As you can see, there are fridges for dairy, um, pasta, produce, and a freezer for other foods. Here are some features of On Your Block Pantry. I decided to go with a mobile pantry similar to a bookmobile rather than stationary building in order to keep it small, cheap, and more convenient. And again, I decided to go for a bookmobile rather than a food truck as people go into bookmobiles while food truck services are limited to serving outdoors. Um, there will also be many pantries scattered across low income neighborhoods, um, which will increase the accessibility. And due to their size, this will be easier as a large number will solve the issue of transportation. Small fees on each item will simulate the grocery experience and provide a small source of income for on your block pantry. Inspired by Help the Children, donations and purchases will support the pantry and allowing low cost to healthy foods. There will also be a health criteria on all the foods sold, so junk food accessibility is lowered. Finally, I dove in to a little bit more of the logistics of uh, Pantry on Your Block. As I said earlier, it will be mainly dependent on partnerships, donations, and purchases. This is inspired by Help the Children. Um, they do a really great job of staying afloat without charging their um, customers. Um, and it allows the food to be really cheap and affordable. Um, similar to Help the Children, again, um, it will also be a nonprofit organization as it won't be dependent on the government because um, if it is dependent on the government, it will require a lot more paperwork. And as I said earlier, um, a lot of low income community or families do not have enough time to be filling out these paperwork, waiting for a government to reach back to them as they're busy with um, jobs and caring for their kids. And finally, I was thinking in order to kickstart um, pantry on your block, I think the best way would be to start off in a wealthy redlined community. Um, because it's in a somewhat nearby a wealthy community, it will have access to wealthy grocery stores to help us get on our feet. And it'll be easier to create partnerships. That way I can, uh, on your block pantry can reach out to even poorer communities or a, a more isolated communities um, with these partnerships already um, developed. And here are some references that I used um, for my research. Thank you. Nice job, Isabel.
Um, Alex Penn, any critique? Um, sure. Um, so um, uh, one thing, um, let me just get my notes here. Um, so one thing at the top uh, uh, is that I would, I would just call out the name of your solution um, because it's easy to remember. Just re repetition um, is really helpful. Um, uh, but obviously, like, um, at the end, you, you talked about that. Um, I thought it was um, really cool how you took uh, almost a very similar prompt with a similar group, but came to a very different solution, but also showed how you whittled it down into um, problems around communities and, and what the act and what the problems are with access to food, and you identify completely separate problems, which um, which are true uh, and, and very interesting. Um, for your journey map, um, it wasn't identified with a user, so you talked about all these different problems, but then I wasn't sure if if the journey map included all of them or included just some of them because when you do a journey map with a user, you can um, figure out for each persona, sorry, um, how those different problems relate to each individual persona. And probably each persona has a different problem like drivability or food swamp or food, um, like, and that's how you would kind of build your personas perhaps by having them each have one of those problems. Um, um, then you talked about um, pros and cons, which um, was clearly helped you come up with a solution that was pretty feasible. Um, the pros tended to be very human centered, like these are things which help people. Then the cons tended to be like scalability issues. So, um, because this is a human centered designathon, I thought it was interesting. Like maybe if you were to go back and say, what are the pros and cons from, from the user standpoint? Like, why is some, some of these solutions are good for them, some are bad for them? And then there are some scalability issues with these that are just about feasibility, not necessarily about how it is good or bad for people. Um, uh, uh. And then, I don't know if um, you were in a group um, with Delaney, but uh, she mentioned in one of our sessions how doing sketches is a really good and fast way to visualize things. And uh, I like how you did that. It's just, it's super easy, it's low commitment, and you can get, you can see things very easily. So uh, I really liked how you use that. Um, uh, and then I just had one question about the, the, uh, pro the product was um, crowd control. I mean, when, I, when I've seen um, a lot of um, places like this, I've seen just a lot of people, especially lately, and I was just wondering, you know, how are you going to monitor if people can go in or not go in? And I'm sure you don't have an answer right now, but um, just something to think about practically speaking, because if, if I knew of a place, um, a pantry where there was a line and a no line and I could just go in, um, I would run to the place with no line uh, and just have a free for all. So um, just something to think about. And yeah, Ben, I don't know if you have any, any comments too. Yeah, I mean, some of the things kind of parallel to what Alex was saying, I think, you know, definitely the personas could have maybe had more um, in in depth build around them just and and kind of tied into that user journey. I think uh, I spoke with you yesterday. I think you did a good job of thinking through some of the logistics around the idea, which is great. Um, it was interesting to see that you kind of took us through your brainstorming session uh, of like the different ideas that you had and showed us kind of where you were going and then why, you, you know, what were some of the things that you thought were barriers to those ideas and then finally showed us the, the pantry on the block idea. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think uh, it was a lot of work to do on your own. So a uh, great job. And yeah, I think the lo-fi Kind of sketching helps to get the point across and i think it did a good job of that um you don't always have to go mid or high fi if you're you know if you're just trying to visualize kind of an experience and, and showcase what you're thinking so i think that was great as well thank you yeah nice job okay um so next we had uh, uh, Brian and Richard volunteered to go next. Wait, sorry, I have to reshare my screen real quick.
Yeah, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about our idea, QSWANA, for the Berkeley Innovation X uh, RKS Intersect Designathon 2021. So hi, my name is Richard. I'm um, an undergraduate in bioengineering at UC Berkeley. I'm a former uh, Queer Alliance Resource Center marketing intern, and I'm also currently the chief marketing officer of a nonprofit called the Medical Reallocation Initiative. And I'm Brian. I'm also a bioengineering undergraduate. Um, I'm focused in graphic design. I work for Diversifier Narrative, which is an ethnic studies uh, representation uh, petition group. And I'm the design chair for the UC Berkeley Biomedical Engineering Society. So our problem statement and the um, underserved community that we decided to tackle was the LGBTQIA plus youth in, uh, South, in the Southwest Asian and North African uh, populations. So we were hoping to look at different ways we could um, provide them resources. So a disclaimer, um, we researched that in attempts to communicate with um, the queer population of these countries, um, it, we should be very careful to um, not impose Western notions of queerness and queer rights um, in our attempt to provide them resources because um, there is, it provi uh, presents an internal conflict within individuals from these populations um, between, uh, uh, between universalism and particularity where they're struggling between two different identities that are presented to them. And we also wanted to note that there's um, a trade-off between homophobia and racism, that not everyone has um, the ability to leave their home, to um, move to a different country because of the, the issues they face in both locations. Right, to touch more on that, neither of us are from a SWANA background. We aren't the most qualified to speak about the issues that this underserved community faces, but we want to listen closely and empower and uh, have close allyship with um, the individuals that we were able to meet this weekend. Um, if many scientific journals uh, impose a Western-centric perspective uh, written by white authors. So with this in mind, we just want to tread carefully and show that we can uh, focus on to the pressing issue that our friends and acquaintances have brought to our attention. So with this in mind, we uh, went ahead and searched up some literature making sure to note the authors and the backgrounds. And a lot of the same statements came up. So here are some that we uh, selected for you. From this publication, there's activism on community building and attitudinal change uh, within the society in their home countries. And there's also a complexity of this movement to open doors for LGBT people in the region. So this is a moment, this has momentum behind it, but it's still very undermet um, with uh, how the inherent structure of those home countries work. And for example, um, with this case study, there's uh, statements to say consensual same-sex relations are criminalized and people are uh, jailed for very minimal or menial reasons. Um, their realities are neglected and they face social or financial exclusion. And this also creates a vilification or disownment from their own families. And in other literature, we noted that the internet became a safer location to openly discuss and express individualism. This is where people have pivoted onto, and we wanted to help address this with um, who we could meet. So speaking of who we could meet, we met up with a friend who was willing to record and share firsthand thoughts as a gay Arab who immigrated to the United States. So here's a soundbite of our conversation with him. So as a teen queer Arab growing up in the Middle East, some of the things that I wish that I had, I wish I had a therapist. A therapist would have definitely helped me navigate a lot of my own identities, especially being conflicted where I had to choose between either being gay or being Arab, not really recognizing that I could do both. Um, I wish I had access to prep. Growing up in a con growing up in the Middle East, you're faced with one of two choices or one of two realities. One where you don't have to worry about, sorry, you worry about HIV or AIDS because if you test positive, then you get deported, or you worry about HIV or AIDS because there's no way of testing for it. Um, I fell into the former, some people fell into the latter. A lot of people experience both, and I feel like that's a very, very big danger. Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, we conducted numerous interviews um, from multiple people who gave us consent uh, to list, list their specific um, thoughts about uh, queer identity in um, Swana countries. So uh, specifically, we, we um, uh, interviewed people from Lebanon, Syria, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And um, so these are some of the notes that they gave us. Uh, they wish they had other gay Arab men out there to guide them and tell them that everything was going to be okay. They wish they had access to therapy and access to PrEP. Um, so just for people that, out there that don't know what PrEP is, PrEP, is, um, PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a medicine that people who are at risk for HIV uh, take to reduce their chances of getting HIV. Um, and they also wish they had mental health resources and that there's a lot of shame, guilt, threats, taboo um, associated with discovering your sexuality when you're growing up in these countries. Um, I, on a different note, there's actually some resources available for um, people who identify as LGBT um, through available through current NGOs. But an interesting point that was brought up was that people are generally afraid of accessing these resources because they're afraid that the people that they meet up with to access these resources will out them to their families. Um, but there is progress. There's a lot of progress with NGOs spreading awareness. Um, providing resources to, to defend LGBT people that are being criminalized, um, and that homosexuality is portrayed as a mental illness, and there's a lot of fear and stigma associated with identity. So the, we narrowed, um, we consolidated these conversation pain points into five main, uh, five main issues that we wanted to address. Um, one of them being access to health resources, um, proper communication, um, proper outreach to uh, teams that might be struggling with their identity, um, a lack of mental health support, stigma, and access to financial resources. Right, and we do want to make clear in our research we found a pre-existing network uh, called AWA, and this uses anonymous uh, gamified uh, user profiles to uh, have a message board, but simply just a message board. It doesn't really have these resource hubs that we aim to have. So our initiative is to have a one-stop shop for a crowdsourced resource hub and maybe even integrate with the pre-existing network to form better connections, mentorship, and accessibility for others into queer, uh, in queer rights. So with this in mind, we made a preliminary systems map. Dash lines represent a negative uh, impact. And as you can see, there's a lot of interconnectivity within uh, just the space that we touched on. This doesn't even begin to uh, scratch the surface of the complexity with uh, say the refugee experience or other aspects we couldn't explore given our time in this weekend. And yet you can still see that it's all very, very important to address all these concerns. So with this in mind, uh, we went ahead and started a branding conceptualization. This is the mood board that I made. Um, I focused a lot on the uh, intricate designs that were inherent to the region um, looking at stuff like uh, the, so the environment, the geography, symbols from flags, the national flowers, and um, Berber carpet patterns from uh, Morocco. Uh, there was also a really cool article or a publication by like a, a thesis from an st art student uh, at the Rochester Institute of Technology named Lena Sambal. And she used um, the kefia, which is the white cap um, and then the headdress, the turban scarf, the uh, sh sh shimag, and the uh, circular igal, which is the black cord. And just these circular designs seem to be prevalent throughout. Uh, and so with this, I made this kind of scheme. It is circular, it has a carpet-like design, but it's also intricate like the national flowers of the region. And here's our solution. So we went ahead and started uh, prototyping. We developed something in Figma, but we also developed something um, in Notion. So Notion is a popular, um, actually a no-code tool for a lot of people aiming to provide a lot of resource uh, resource hubs to different communities. And so we just drafted up um, uh, a version of our idea that would be like available as a sort of pseudo website. So this would be just the bare bones like skeleton of a website. Um, and we'd, we'd market this heavily to um, uh, queer youth within uh, 
Southwest Asian and North African populations. Yeah, so I'm going to go into our user persona. So let's um, let's discuss uh, Sara. So Sara is a 16 year old and she's currently questioning her gender identity in an actively transphobic and homophobic household in Syria. And she's deeply afraid of, um, with, of talking with her family about her internal struggles and her stress. Yeah. So um, Sara is a trans man who feels estranged and isolated from his family. Um, and his family kicks him out of his home. Um, and he is threatened with housing and financial instability. Um, and he's just very distraught. So he's looking for someone to talk to and looking for financial and housing resources. So he eventually finds our resource compilation site where he submits a form explaining his situation. And then he goes on, um, our site goes on to connect him with a career support group in the area that we can find or offers him a mentor who is well versed in understanding trans issues and experiences. He's eventually connected with more resources that um, provide active affirmation and support both in material resources and in his mental health. So here's our end pro value proposition. We help members of the LGBTQIA plus Kswana community find resources and support by becoming a comprehensive resource hub on demand resource request platform in a safe space for queer conversations. Uh, we used this weekend as a deep dive into learning about a standard design methodology. We chose a complex and urgent issue in this world because of the struggles we have heard about from people we've met at Berkeley. And we've uh, learned how to take an empathetic, human centered approach to tackling this issue. We've gone through most of the design oriented steps to learn about this space, build on existing work, and educate ourselves. But most importantly, is the fact that we can't speak for the thousands in this demographic who experience this, um, who experience this and many other struggles every single day. But we can learn how to be better allies and how to best support them through interaction with identity, community leaders, and people who have experienced um, these issues firsthand. We've barely scratched the surface of this topic this weekend, but we found this to be a challenging, enriching, and overall perfect experience to showcase the intersectionality available through design, especially as a topic for Intersect. And we're really grateful for the opportunity to explore this topic with BI and RKS hosting this and letting us put so much theory into practice in this short time. With that, that's our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. Um, super appreciative of the amount of um, research that you all put in um, and your commitment to accurate and well thought out research um, within like less than a day. So huge props. Um, Alex and Ben, do you have any critique? Um, ben, you want to go or you want me to go? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, as Connor said, the great research on your guys' side, I like how you guys brought in um, kind of the uh, piece of the discussion that you had and, and highlighted some key insights from other people. Um, we tend to do that just to kind of help stimulate uh, the people that were uh, like our clients that we're presenting to and help them empathize with what we're trying to do. Um, definitely think, you know, the, the idea is great. I think we talked about this a little bit, but, you know, getting support um, outside of your network, if you don't have a network to support you, uh, very important. And I think, you know, even beyond that community, I think your idea has the ability to, to scale beyond just that community, right? And then really expand. Um, but I think, you know, it was overall a, a great idea. Um, I think the would have been nicer to kind of dive a little bit more into the personas a, a little bit, I think. Um, but um, I, I know it was a short timeline, so, um, but no, but I think those are the main points for me. Yeah, good, good input. Um, to be transparent, uh, we, I sort of DM Richard when we got into the personas because we already <laughs> went past 10 minutes. <laughs> no worries. Um, Echoing what Ben said, I, I agree with it. Um, first, I, I learned a lot, um, so I appreciate that too. Um, I thought your disclaimer was carefully done. Um, mostly what I learned about it was you understood that you were not the people this product was for necessarily, and so you were really trying to figure it out. Um, um, and um, uh, I think that um, the map you had where you talked about the solutions and the negative loops and the positive was very helpful. It took me a sec. I hadn't seen something like that before, but 
I did see after I realized what was happening, the mentorship was a really critical thing by looking at that. And I was like stunned how easy it was to see that. Um, that mentorship was really something. And, and also um, discrete sort of communication was really important, um, which makes sense based on what you said. Um, I thought the branding, uh, the way you went about it, trying to pull in local um, culture to make it very comfortable um, was, was interesting. Um, maybe it's a little bit too soon to talk about branding just because it's very early in the product. Um, the persona, you you didn't use an image um, for the for the person, but I think in this context it works because the whole notion is people can't identify themselves. So um, it, it's like one of those weird cases where it actually makes sense. Uh, I thought that made sense. Um, I think if you had started with the personas earlier and then uh, use it again, I mean, we talked about it with other people too. It, it helps with more justification though. You did talk about pain points earlier on and having that sound bite and hearing someone speak was, was very powerful, um, but also could have been the perfect time to talk about personas and match those um, pain points to the personas. Um, uh, and then I guess my last question would be, in, in, is this, was this product meant to, um, you talked about how this spans many regions, the Middle East and Africa, I mean, it's a very broad community, the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, is this supposed to serve everyone or did you have in mind and you just didn't share a specific persona um, or that, that, it, that it was supposed to solve? I mean, because I imagine there might be differences, you don't have to answer this, but there might be differences within regions, differences within people who identify differently within regions, difference in ages. I mean, I mean there may be a lot of variation um, and differences in the product choices you might want to make based on that. So. Uh, yeah, really cool. I would I would love to actually speak on that. Um, so we were definitely um, focusing on um, predominantly Arabic speaking uh, countries. Uh, we were thinking of expanding to um, South Asian and East Asian cultures, but at the same time, we wanted to really narrow our focus to make sure we had a specific target audience. And what you said about like um, identification of specific um, communities within these countries is also a really critical um, point. And it's something we definitely uh, wanted to consider. Um, I just wanted to know as like um, a semi unrelated tangent uh, that the trans community and the, the gay community within Japan is actually almost has a really separate history of development. And um, we have to understand and research these, these situations and the culture behind the development of these communities within individual regions um, so we can better cater to them. And absolutely, yeah. That makes sense. I also want to quickly touch upon the uh, systems map that we designed. Um, yeah, again, thank you all, like both for your really thoughtful comments. A big thing that I want to uh, explore more is just the systems map engineering. And uh, it was brought to me in a product design class. And it seems like not many firms use like this kind of mapping to address different factors that are all like variables in the final product. So uh, it's pretty interesting way of approaching a topic as well. Nice job, guys. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so the next group is going to be Ryan, Kevin, Mirabelle, Isabel, Veda, and Shannon. Give me one second to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see it? Okay. Hi everyone, we are Park Rex. My name is Ryan and these are my teammates. If I could have them introduce themselves, some of them aren't here yet. I'm Kevin. Nice to meet y'all. I'm Veda. Um, I'm Allison. And the rest couldn't make it to the presentation. But here's the agenda for today. We're first going to go over research and personas, then take you through our ideation process, and finally our mid five prototype with some time for questions at the end. So let's get started. So research and need finding. 
After considering a variety of ways to empower underserved communities, we've arrived at the topic of green spaces. First, we want to have a concrete idea of what a green space is. So what exactly is a green space? It's defined as access to parks and nature, and your access to green spaces is affected by factors like proximity, condition of the park, safety, and aesthetics of these spaces and any programs offered by the community. Why is green space important? It affects the well being of every member of the society. And here's some interesting facts about these green spaces. People without access to these spaces have 55% risk of developing psychiatric disorders. Children who grew up with closer to parks were less likely to develop health and problems later in life. And this issue intersects with harmful factors like in the pandemic. Recent research shows that air pollution is also correlated with COVID death rates. Based on those statistics, we see that it's absolutely vital to have access to green spaces, but unfortunately, some communities are better off than others. Right here in the Bay Area, for example, some communities in San Francisco have a 30% canopy cover, whereas lower income neighborhoods have hovering around 5%. So this disparity is really visible in the different neighborhoods of the city and socioeconomically disadvantaged communities are systematically deprived of green spaces and all of the benefits that they bring. This research led our team to the problem that we wanted to tackle. More green spaces need to be integrated into daily life in underserved youth communities. So our goal was how might we tackle how might we increase socioeconomically disadvantaged communities' access to green spaces in their area? With this goal in mind, we created user personas to represent the needs of our target communities, and here are the attributes that we included in the personas, which you will see in action in the next few slides. So this is our first persona. This is V. She is 16 years old and she's from Minneapolis and her family's pretty well off and she lives in a really nice neighborhood that's well endowed with parks. As you can see, the park score of her neighborhood is 82.3 out of 100, which is extremely high. And the nearest park is only five minutes away. And those are her wants and needs and pain points as you see at the bottom. Over the next few personas, you'll see how the access to parks really varies and which this is highly correlated with their socioeconomic status. As you can see, RS's neighborhood in Houston only has a neighborhood park score of 40. And we can see that it affects people of color a lot more than non-people of color communities. KT doesn't even have a car to drive and the nearest park is 12 minute drive away. So this access is really variable and it's not beneficial to a lot of these people. And the next few personas are similar. And now we'll go through ideation and iteration. So while brainstorming, we developed ideas that fell into four main categories, physical, landscape, policy, and digital. In the physical section, we had ideas like hosting community events to improve stickiness, but ultimately it didn't provide a means of transportation to a green space, which is one of the major issues our personas required assistance with. As for landscape, it was also overall just too costly and too complex of a solution to try and implement, especially since developing the environment could also conflict with the current infrastructure of the existing community. And within our policy section, we thought about sort of citywide garden walls as a mandate, which would greatly increase green spaces without any significant land requirements. However, it didn't address convention green space needs like open spaces for sports, playgrounds, hiking, etc. Um, and with, the, with this being said, we settled with our digital category coming up with an app that promotes community engagement at green spaces, as well as providing the necessary information for transportation to a green space. In our app, we have three main features, the ability to share and upload pictures of the park, get directions for bus routes, and advertisements for local businesses around the park. Um, ultimately, we up 
you can upload videos and pictures to promote your community engagement. And you also can receive bus route information um, as a good resource for transportation. And that's pretty much it. Um, so I'm going to go into the prototype presentation a little bit and and the prototype, this basic storyboard that we came up with is that um, you have a persona who needs a break, doesn't have money really, and can't take the a lot of time to go out. So they would check their phone, go on our app, um, see what kind of parks that are nearby and see if they like any of the parks. They could also go on our app and look at the events that each of the park is happening, that is happening at each of the parks and it could, um, the events could include um, promoting like health and wellness and then so much more that would really just, you know, benefit the persona. And it would also be really easy because you would have easy access to bus routes and easy access to navigation systems to get to the parks easier. And it would be really simple, really easy, quick, and you wouldn't have to spend any money. Um, this is our like login sign up page It's really simple self explanatory. Um, the login is basically for um, you can save park recommendations. So if you like a specific park, you can save it for later. And that would also be really helpful if you want to go back and see parks that you visited as well. You can also continue as guest because that is always an option if you don't want to log. Um, these are ba our basic home pages. And what it has is a one large, you know, photo and then the distance from you. So if you allow access to your location, it can calculate how far you are, can calculate how big, and it also gives like a decent showcase of what events are happening at that time. Um, the profile also really self-explanatory. You can edit preferences. So you can um, you know, set a maximum distance for where you want to go. Say you only want to walk a mile at most for the park, or you can say you have a car and you can drive like 10 miles. It really just depends. Um, this, this is, is the, our like live streaming feature. Yeah. This is the live streaming feature and it's just an option for signed up members to be able to live stream locally and it allows other people who aren't at the park to see what's happening at the park right now, bringing more communities together. Yeah, as for the map and bus routes, uh, this is just a very low fidelity um, mock-up. Um, we wanted to centralize sort of this entire experience of getting to a park with an app, just so there's no hassle in terms of like transportation and that. So. Um, we wanted to provide a mapping slash bus system, which would provide sort of schedules for buses and also a map that you can see small businesses around the park. So ultimately to support community engagement. Um, this is just a sort of <laughs> mock-up that we did just so we could provide an example for how this app would look like in the hand. So moving on to the conclusion, as I want to re reiterate, green space has a transformative impact on communities from changing the behavior of people's leisure towards a less consumer based activity like shopping to create a safe space for people to relax and connect with the present moment in a crowded, fast paced society. I also want to clarify our personas were also young because we noticed that mirroring a natural national trend. 45% of youth between the ages of 12 and 17 reported having a struggled with mental issues, with nearly a third of them experiencing serious psychological distress that could interfere with their academic and social functioning, according to the UCLA policy brief. Our app bridges that gap of connections to nature, spirit, communities, and people through the easiness and stickiness of the interface. Park Rec does not believe in displacing undeserved communities, and we allow communities to take control of their spaces by supporting their local businesses and keeping the money flowing locally, by cre easily creating their own events and live streams that bring people together and promote growth, and by giving easy access to green spaces, whether it be in real life or through a screen.
Park Rag wants people to remind it what it's like to be a human in a struggling environment. And we believe our service provides that. Yeah, and just to follow up, how much did our solution actually address the audience's needs? One common need that we saw in a lot of our young personas was transportation, which is why our app targets that as an easy, low-cost way to get to the nearby parks. And then once you're in the app, you're able to see which parks you'd like to go to. In addition, we consider the five criteria below, which were very important, such as cost and feasibility to implement and how much it promotes stickiness and bringing the community to that one focal point. Yeah, and we're really excited to hear your critiques. Overall, we had an incredible time collaborating and participating in the Designathon and attending all the talks. So we're so grateful for this opportunity and excited to hear what you have to say. Nice job, guys. Um, any critiques from Ben and Alex? Uh, you guys kind of mentioned having like sponsorships or you know paid advertising. I guess. You guys didn't touch much on that after that in, in the app experience. I'm just wondering about that a little bit. And if you guys thought about like potentially to increase stickiness through like creating, like aside from the events, like drawing in, you know, like food trucks or farmers markets or concerts at the park or like ways to, that could help kind of monetize it, but then also create the, the stickiness that you guys were thinking about, you know, aside from just like, creating the event at the park. Did you guys think about things like that or? Yeah, to sort of answer that question, um, one idea that we um, were initially brainstorming but we couldn't get to mainly because of time constraints is primarily sort of like a snack pass system um, alongside with our map and bus system where we could partner with small local businesses such as food trucks um, and restaurants where they can offer up deals and we would promote sort of their locations on our app. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, some interesting research that you guys found kind of relating to green spaces and like how you guys um, thought through some of the other ideas of like physical spaces, but then kind of understanding the, the logistics around not being able to maybe do that, or even if you did a wall gardens, how it didn't provide kind of the the benefit that you guys were looking for and why that might not work but um i think you guys did a great job of kind of outlining uh, an approach that might be feasible i think you know thinking through the the challenge around busing and, and getting people to locations is, is always a challenge and making it easy to, for them to understand what options they have i think is uh something that's kind of a, a big challenge to overcome That's all for me. Thank you. Uh, it was nice to see the, the completion of this. I remember meeting you guys. Um, and um, I thought um, I thought it was clear from the beginning what you were focusing on. I, I kind of knew because I had, I had heard before, but green spaces um, was a very clear definition of what the issue was and, and how people were underserved. Um, um, so for the um, personas, adding the uh, neighborhood park score was an interesting way to quantify the difference, the, the problem, and um, also talk, like, differentiate all the personas a little bit too, because some have, are closer, but they don't have, they have different problems than being close, and some are farther, and that's their problem. And so I thought that was a really cool way of using that data. Um, I also thought it was neat how you did the brainstorm on the screen for us, you, you walked us through your thinking. Um, the problem I had was that there were so many words, it was difficult for me to like keep them all in my head. I knew I wanted to see it on the screen and I wanted to see like some some animations or something of like this and this and this and this and this and this and, this and kind of walk me through that way. Um, that's, uh, that's actually feedback I've gotten, which was really helpful. So um, I'll just pass that along to you. Um, I think a competitive matrix could have been helpful. Um, Google Maps has some explore feature that's not does not do what this it does, but does probably have some ideas for you on how to do this well. Um, similarly, uh, Foursquare was this for restaurants. They failed, but they succeeded very quickly and for a long time. I, I guess they're still around, but looking at their successes and failures could be a really interesting way of figuring out what to do for your app because 
they've built it out for a different a different product. Um, thought the live streaming was a cool idea because it builds FOMO around visiting parks uh, immediately. Um, and FOMO is an interesting way of getting people to do things. Um, and then just at the end, the value proposition was really clear and it's nice to end it with talking about um, who this product is for, like what you're solving, the problem you're solving, what you're doing, and what exactly you're doing to solve it. So I think you were very close to doing that and it's, it's nice to remember the value proposition at the end. So yeah, great job, guys. Yeah, yeah. I think Alex's Thank point. You so much. To Alex's point too, and this for every group is like visual storytelling versus words on a, a, a page. There's always like a balance that you have to try to strike. And, you know, we struggle with that too, even, you know, when we're looking at or, you know, presenting research or print, presenting design, like there has to be some foundational information there that backs up your story, but then kind of just being able to pull away the stuff that maybe isn't important or highlighting the things that are more important. Kind of like you do with an app, right? When you're talking about visual hierarchy. So I think that's a, a good point that Alex uh, brought up. And that can be applied to everyone. For sure. Okay, cool. Um, thank you all for your presentations. They were super impressive. Um, big props to all of you, especially for doing this much work in like less than a day. Um, so, me, Alex, and Ben are going to um, have some quick delibs um, regarding awards. Um, so you all can stay in here and just chat amongst yourselves if you want. Or if you want, you can um, take a break, um, go AFK for a bit, um, and then I will post in Slack when we've decided. But yeah. Feel free to stay in here. Me, Alex, and Ben will be in um, a breakout room. Good job, everyone. Good job. Good, good job. job.